uh, supply function is essentially this. It's inversely proportional, one to the difference between the prevailing wage rate in the area and the, and the welfare level. In other words, if the prevailing wage rate remains the, if the, if the welfare level remains the same, if the prevailing wage rate in the area rises, people start leaving welfare and going on to you know, start working because the difference between the money they can get from working and the money they get from welfare increases. This gap goes up. So they go off welfare and onto the payroll. <laughs> if, on the other hand, the welfare level goes up, the prevailing wage remains the same, then they start going on welfare because the amount of money they can get from working, which is generally a pain in the neck, uh, is, you know, decreases. So the incentive to go on welfare uh, increases. <clears throat> So this means that being on welfare is not somehow a divine act. In other words, it doesn't, it doesn't come from outside the system. Uh, being on welfare is a supply function, and it responds to different incentives and disincentives. And one of the incentives is the prevailing wage rate as compared to the welfare rate, <coughs> welfare payment rate. And it's also the supply function of going on welfare is, is inversely proportional to the cultural disincentive, as we put it. In other words, that the stronger the cultural aversion, cultural um, resistance to being on welfare, the less the people will tend to be on it. Uh, this accounts, for example, for the reason why rural, rural, the rural poor, uh, they're much less rural poor going on welfare than urban poor, even though rural poor are just as poor, not even more so. But in the rural areas, there's a stigma, a general social stigma in the, in the neighborhood for going on welfare. It's generally imposed, and, and bitterly so, especially with people who are paying for it, in other words, the, the local folk who are working and paying taxes for it. And so that because of the stigma, that far fewer people go on it. In the urban areas, the stigma tends to be lost, and everybody sort of, you know, says, you don't know your neighbor and so forth. And this cultural disincentive then uh, uh, is removed. Also, there was a very charming article uh, a couple of weeks ago in the New York Times. I don't know if you've, how many of you have seen it, on the Albanians in New York. The Albanians uh, just uh, had their first uh, church in the world, first Albanian Catholic church in the world. There was a whole discussion of the Albanian, Albanian community. <clears throat> Apparently, the Albanians in New York are invariably very poor. They're all slum dwellers, and none of them are on welfare. The simple reason, as, as one Albanian leader put it, Albanian-American leader put it, quote, Albanians do not beg, and to Albanians, taking welfare is like begging on the street, period. So since to, to the Albanian, being on welfare is like begging on the street, they just not, are not on welfare, even though their income level is much lower <clears throat> than the average population. <clears throat> the same goes for the Chinese-Americans, who are generally poor but almost none on welfare. Uh, but I'll get back to the whole welfare question a little bit later. At any rate, uh, the, ne the negative income tax, by making the dole automatic, uh, I contend, opens the floodgates uh, to an enormous increase, enormous accession of people living on production. And here I recommend Henry Hazlitt's cr uh, critique of the negative income tax in the Freeman about, uh, I think, four years ago, July 66. Uh, in the first place, what obviously is going to happen if the negative income tax is put in, is that the floor, which is which Friedman sets at essentially fifteen hundred dollars a year, because it's it's uh, three thousand with fifty percent off, so it's, it amounts to fifteen hundred a year. Uh, this floor obviously will start increasing at the beat the band at a very rapid rate, because the first thing that people will say is, well, three thousand dollars is officially considered by the government as the poverty level for a family of four, and therefore you can't subsidize people, we can't have a, a guaranteed income below the poverty level, and so therefore we have to raise the Immediately to 3,000 for 1,500. That'll be the first outcry. Secondly, of course, there'll have to be cost of living increases every year because there'll be inflation every year, and this will, this will add on to the floor. And thirdly, uh, of course, the welfare client organizations are already demanding their so called right to a guaranteed $6,000 a year income. <clears throat> and this is, uh, you know, so this is, so the hopped up pressure to, to, to keep raising the floor almost indefinitely is already underway. So even before the thing has begun. <coughs> so it's pretty obvious that this floor, starting at a fairly reasonable looking 1500, is going to skyrocket very quickly. But there's another point. That's a fairly obvious point. The other point is that who will continue working? You know, which person who gets below the floor, for example, will keep working? Uh, I, I maintain very few people. In other words, if the floor is 3000 a year, be very, very few people will keep working at 2500 a year. But they can just simply quit, work zero hours a week sit on the porch and get 3000 from the government instead of getting 500 from the government. So what I contend is that, well, what happens is the current, you see, if you, if you see the, the current estimates about the cost of a guaranteed annual income, the cost will look fairly reasonable, 5 billion a year, 10 billion, 15 billion, doesn't look catastrophic. However, these costs are all based on the assumption that everybody will, con will continue working in the same way they're working now. So the disincentive effect, which seems to me will be catastrophic, 
and this sort of thing are not are not taken into account. Uh, so the fact that you have the, the guys every if, if the floor is three thousand, I can tell everybody below three thousand will quit pretty quickly. If they don't quit, they're pretty pretty screwy. Uh, they'll, they'll quit. The person getting three thousand will quit. Or how about people getting above three thousand? Well, they're gonna they're gonna quit too. I mean, because if you're getting say thirty five hundred a year, it means you're working forty hours a week in order to get five hundred dollars a year. <laughs> That's not very much. So I think people will quit on mass up to at least four thousand, maybe five thousand a year, something like that. Now, as they quit, this means they have an enormous number of people flooding onto the dole. Somebody's got to pay for this. And of course, the, the person who pays for it is the taxpayer. This means taxes have to, have to be increased very sharply on the guys who are still working, the guys getting above 5000 a year. And as the taxes are increased on them, their after-tax income goes down, maybe to 4000 or 3000 So they start quitting. <laughs> so, what you, and uh, as they start quitting, this, this, this uh, you know this floods the roll some more, and then they have to increase the taxes on those continuing to work. Maybe those above six thousand, they start quitting. So, what I'm saying is, I envision with a guaranteed annual income a, a vicious spiral upward or downward, or whatever, until we wind up with nobody, everybody on the dole, nobody working, <laughs> which uh, even the Keynesians can't really <laughs> you know cope with <laughs> that kind of assistance. I, I I just foresee total disaster with this uh, this thing coming into effect. <clears throat> Uh, also, just as another uh, extra sort of tidbit on this, is that the Freeman Dole, along uh, in addition to the present one, but the Freeman Dole is automatic, uh, uh, increases the subsidy per kid, per, per welfare kid. In other words, a, a family of eight people, six kids, or seven kids, or whatever, gets a lot more proportionally than a person with two kids. And if you're paying people per kid, it means it subsidizes the kid population. <laughs> in other words, and especially subsidizes the kid population among the poor, the very people whom you we should have less kids, if not, you know, not, not more. Now, I don't buy the whole thing about the whole current hysteria about the population bomb and the population explosion. Everybody should, we should all you know, commit suicide in order to stop air pollution and all that sort of thing. I don't, I don't go along with that. But surely we shouldn't be deliberately subsidizing more kids among poor people. It seems to me a very peculiar kind of system. But here again, the Friedman's negative income tax would do this as an automatic right. Don't forget. In other words, he couldn't talk to the person saying maybe you should have a few less kids or something like that. So it'd be considered, a, you know, and it would be, in fact, uh, an intrusion on their privacy. <clears throat> uh, so therefore, what I'm saying is that it's not true that the Friedman plan, as many conservatives say, would be would be better at least than the current system, although not ideal. What I'm saying is it'd be a lot, much, much worse than the current system, precisely because it would be efficient, in quotes, and automatic, and a guaranteed sort of thing. And this, uh, incidentally, is an example, it seems to me, of Friedman's general general penchant for making the existing system more efficient, and by doing it, making it much worse. This is, I think, just one example of this. Uh, <clears throat> also, of course, another point is that in practice, if Friedman wants a negative income tax to replace all current welfare system, you abolish the entire patchwork of welfare programs, you substitute the negative income tax. In practice, what's going to happen, as we see is already happening with the Nixon program, is that the guaranteed annual income will, will be added on top of the current welfare stuff. It won't, be, it won't replace anything. Nobody's going to get rid of free lunches for, for blind mothers and that sort of thing. Nobody. <laughs> All that's going to stay. On top of that, we're going to get the, we're going to get the, the guaranteed annual income. Now, for example, the, uh, when the Social Security proposal first came in, the big talking point, one of, one of the big talking points of the Social Security proposal in the 30s was, well, look, here we have a, a patchwork of existing hodgepodge of inefficient state old, old age relief programs, you know, different states paying different amounts, and it's all very peculiar and bureaucratic. Why don't we have a very efficient social security system at the federal level? We make each person pay for his old age relief, and that's it. Then we can abolish old age relief, saying the thing will really be less costly to the taxpayer than before. That was the, that was the big economic talking point. Of course, what happened in practice was that the, not only the social security costs continue to rise astronomically, but old age relief itself is much higher now than it was in the 1930s. In other words, nobody abolished state old age relief. We simply added the Social Security on top of the old programs. <clears throat> this is obviously what's going to happen with a negative income tax. Uh, also, of course, I think the, it's pretty clear that the, uh, the so-called requirement of the Nixon program, this is just a, and this is nothing, no, nothing to do with Friedman at this point, but simply the Friedman in, in action is what the Nixon program really is. Uh, the conservative requirement, in quotes, that all able-bodied able recipients of the thing have to go to work and have to get a job is obviously a phony. I mean, nobody's going to enforce it. It's going to be just as enforceable as the current. I mean, nowadays, in order to get unemployment insurance relief, unemployment benefits, you're supposed to have to work at whatever the you know, employment service sends you to. 
Of course, that's obviously a phony. I don't know of any case of anybody who's really forced to work on this basis because you, uh, the, the requirement, of course, is you have to work at a suitable uh, job or a job that you consider suitable. Of course, you know, you don't consider any job suitable. That's that. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's fairly simple. So I, you know, this whole thing is obviously just a sop to conservatives, the, the whole work requirement to, to, to uh, sugarcoat the guaranteed annual income program. Uh, and also there's an, another point about the handicapped people on welfare, and that is that this reduces the, the – the, the, and this is some Chicago people have done some good work in, I must say. Uh, the idea of the of a welfare – automatic welfare dole reduces the marginal incentive for a handicapped person to invest in his own vocational rehabilitation because it means that the, the net economic return he gets from being rehabilitated is much less. He, he may, might even disappear altogether if you, you know, put him on a uh, – uh, a guaranteed income. <clears throat> As a result of that, and Estelle James has done some pretty good work on that, the quantitative importance of this uh, policy. As a result of that, uh, the welfare program and the negative income tax program tends to keep people handicapped. In other words, it tends to subsidize them to, be, to continue to be handicapped instead of being rehabilitated. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in general, the whole problem of welfare de dependency will be aggravated by the Friedman Plan because, once again, they'll consider this now an automatic right instead of simply, you know, sort of something to, uh, which they might get or might not get. Uh, the proper solution, seems to me, to the whole welfare question is the, the libertarian solution, which is voluntary welfare rather than governmental welfare altogether. Uh, the key here is to promote the idea, which, of course, almost inevitably has to accompany voluntary charity, because since voluntary charity has a limited budget, they have to start pushing the idea of Encouraging self-help, in other words, among the recipients. In other words, helping people, the idea of help them becomes helping people to help themselves, get them on their feet so they can become productive and off the, off the charity roll. Now, this principle was the principle of a famous charity organization society in 19th century England, which was extremely effective. Uh, it was the famous uh, laissez-faire principle at the time. And uh, <clears throat> uh, again, uh, the, 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 the points I may, may raised about the Albanians and the Chinese are going to come in here because... The point is that if people begin to adopt the values of self-help and independence, they will get off the welfare rolls also. This is a tremendous reinforcement of this. And we reinforce these particular values by abandoning government programs and encouraging voluntary programs. Uh, for example, the Mormon church, I understand, has very successful – no Mormons go on welfare either. The Mormon church has a very successful voluntary welfare program, which, which gives people give – them, for their members, which gives members help in order to get them on their feet. And apparently, they're very, they're very successful at doing this. <coughs> Uh, okay, I just want to also want to say in passing about uh, the negative income tax. The whole idea of it, and the reason why Friedman falls for it, in essence, is because it stems from the old Chicago position of consider of first of all being in favor of uh, compulsory egalitarianism or equalization of incomes. You know, this is again the Simon's position, it's more or less in favor of smashing all, you know, taxing everybody above a certain level and paying everybody below that level. Now, Friedman doesn't go that far, but the point is that the the, the, there's still this hangover, a remnant of that tradition, in saying that in separating the micro and the macro. In other words, the idea is you have the micro out here. This is an Alfred Marshall in 19th century England and so forth position, the general Anglo-American tradition. You got the micro over here where, where individual prices are determined by individual supply and demand. That's one one sphere. Then you have the macro sphere over here where total prices, price level, is determined by the money supply. So you have, and these two things are never really meet. You have the macro out there, and you have the micro out there, and that's it. There's no, <clears throat> there's no integration. And so the really, the real, the real hidden assumption here of the Friedman position is that you can tax people really as much as you want. It doesn't interfere with their incentives because their incentives are determined by marginal productivity. It's, it's a different sphere out there. And uh, but I'm going to get back to this whole separation thing later when I get to money. Okay, that's the negative income tax. Uh, now we come to. Uh, a crucial area, I think, where I differ uh, with Friedman, the whole area of money and business cycles, which is, incidentally is Friedman's major topic of interest. It's the area where he's worst on. It's also his major topic of interest. This, this incidentally, seems to be a sort of a – it happens often in the, in the history of social thought and economic thought and everything else. The area where the particular person happens to be worst on, he, start, he sort of pushes <laughs> for his whole life. And this is a, a sort of unfortunate development. At any rate uh, – here again, Freeman is essentially almost completely a reversion to Irving Fisher, who wrote, incidentally, from around 1890s to 1920s. Uh, Freeman's whole monetary approach, I mean Fisher, excuse me, Fisher's whole monetary approach and his whole business cycle approach, which are very 